have with us, four of the highest profile figures in British politics and business. And tonight the format will be they'll introduce themselves for a few minutes each. And then we'll have some questions we've got prepared for the whole panel. And then we'll open it up for QA. Um, so please feel free to ask questions later on tonight and think of some. business, 
You have to work hard. You have to work very hard. You have to try your best continuously, and you have to make sure uh, that you're very focused, you're very productive, you're very structured, you plan what you're going to do, and you have the conviction of your beliefs, and you carry them through, and it's hard work. Often there are doubting Thomases, people who will challenge you and question you, people you love and respect and trust. Um, but if you're in business, you have to believe in the fundamentals that uh, have got you to wherever you've got to in your career, and you have to stick to your guns and you have to go forward. However, uh, despite all that hard work, if you realize you've made a mistake, you have to put your hand up quickly, not just to yourself, but to everybody else, and say, you know what, I have to do a a U-turn here, I got this wrong. It was a wrong decision, it was a bad investment, let's cut our losses, let's try to mitigate the disaster, and let's move, uh, move forward. So you have to be bold, you have to have courage, you have to be able to admit and accept your defeats, and move forward still in a very positive, aggressive way. Obviously, I'm talking from the perspective of an entrepreneur, um, somebody who has no um, no fixed business, no uh, dedicated uh, career particularly in mind, but is taking uh, advantage of, uh, of the opportunities as, as they come. Having said that, I think there are two vital things when you're in business. One is to be honest. If you're not honest, you'll get caught out. Eventually, you'll get caught out. Eventually, it will be your downfall. You've got to be honest. If you start in business at 20, better be honest till you're 80, 90, whenever you stop being in business. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with everybody else you do business with. Put your hands on the table, be transparent, be straightforward. You've got to be honest. And you'll make mistakes, things go wrong. There's nobody who's successful in business can honestly look in the mirror and say, I haven't had failures, I haven't had disasters, I haven't lost money. It's just not true. They're lying. So you've got to be honest. People respect you. People respect you for your successes, but they also respect you for being honest with your, with your failures. And in doing business, perhaps one of the most important things that I have learned is always be fair. Always be fair. Never be greedy. Leave a squeeze in the lemon for the next person. Don't maximize your profit. Just don't do it. Don't try to get in at the bottom and get out at the top. It's called being greedy. And greedy people aren't usually happy people. And if you're not a happy person, you probably aren't really successful in business. Because making money, lots of money, is not the measure of the real success. Yes, it's a measure. And people do judge it these days uh, very severely about net worth, and how much it's worth, how much it's made. But actually, being successful in business is just part of life. And if you're not successful in life as a whole, you're not really successful in business. You may have made a lot of money. You may have lost your wife, you may have alienated your children, you may have pissed off your friends. All kinds of things happen if you're too focused on the business of making money. It should not be the only priority in your life. People whose only priority, in my experience, who are only focused on making money and being more powerful and more successful in business, are not necessarily successful in the broader definition of life. Being happy, having friends, having a family you can enjoy, pursuing hobbies and interests and other things are also important. So the intensity of doing business is necessary and relevant a lot of the time, but it mustn't be all the time. It must be some of the time. Perhaps the last thing I would just say is, we all go up the ladder and we all come down the ladder. And we do it several times in life, or most people do. We have our ups and we have our downs and we're kings and we're nobodies and then we're back to being kings and we're winners and we're losers. And that's really true for most people in business. And whether it's our fault or somebody else's fault, we receive criticism, we uh, are not in favor, all kinds of things happen. And the most important thing of all that I have learned in business, and if I could leave you with one vital message, you need friends. If you want to succeed in business, you need friends. You make friends on the way up and on the way down. And those friends you meet and make on the way up will 
will be the ones who help you when you're on the way down and will help you back up again. So whether it's the concierge, whether it's the janitor in the loo, whoever it might be, from the lowest level to the highest level, you must try to make them your friend. Because all of them in your career in business, at some point or other, will play a role. They'll put a word in here, they'll have a little influence there, they'll give you confidence, they'll do a million things for you that help you in your business endeavors if they're your friend. So always treat the people on the way up with the same courtesy, the same respect, the same friendship that you would like them to extend to you when you're on the ladder down. So the important thing is not to give up. Don't give up. <coughs> keep at it. Keep working. Be persistent. And there's a good chance that that will come your way. And find out what you're good at, what you're best at. I have a simple belief that we were put on this planet to try and make the most of whatever qualities, gifts, talents, and attributes we were lucky enough to be given at the beginning. And the main task of education, in my mind, is to help everyone find out what they're best at, what their particular talents and attributes and <coughs> gifts are, and then to teach them to maximize their potential and to make the most of those gifts and talents <coughs> and attributes, and thereby to make a difference to the world and to make it a better place. And that doesn't always mean what people would normally define as material success. I had the great privilege to be chairman of an organization called Help the Hospices. It's the umbrella organization for all the hospices in the country. This afternoon, I spent the afternoon at a hospice in Oxford. It's called Ellen House. It was the first children's hospice in the world in the world. It's here in Oxford, set up 30 years ago, set up by an incredible woman called Sister Frances. She's an Anglican sister, a member of an Anglican order, and she had the idea of setting up a place that would look after children who are near the end of their lives. And of course, to visit a hospice, any hospice, and to visit this one in particular, this afternoon is one of the most moving experiences you can have. They are remarkably, they're very joyful places, they're wonderful places. And on any measure of success which I would define, Sister Frances, who you had ever heard of, and who I'm sure is a woman of very modest means, is one of the most successful people I've ever come across. And someone who has 
in so many ways made a huge difference to the families of, of those who've come under her care, under the care of the hospice, and to the community in which she lives. So you can define success in many ways. And the thing I would like to leave you with, the thought I would like to leave you with, is find out what you're best at. Find out how you can make the greatest use of whatever talents, gifts, attributes you're lucky enough to be given. And then work hard and persistently to make the most of those talents. In that way, you'll be successful and you'll make the greatest and most positive contribution to the community in which you live.
the same odds as everyone else. Because those of you who are statisticians here, is there a few statisticians? No. Okay, <laughs> nobody does numbers in Oxford. Good. That's probably the other thing I was good at numbers. Um, you find out the average is out. So do your homework, prepare yourself, make sure you've got the advantage, because it just doesn't come. And for me, every time I go into a deal or do have to achieve something, I would work so hard, I would stack the cards in my favour to give me a chance of winning. And even then, sometimes you lose, because that's a fact of life. You'll make wrong decisions. It was said earlier, the person that says you never made a mistake, never made a wrong decision, is a person that has never made a decision, or is a bloody liar. So you will get things wrong, but make sure you stack the cards in your favour. Find out what you're good at. Why would you go and do something that you're average at? What's going to happen if you're average at something? You're going to deliver average output. Find the thing that you're good at, because that gives you that advantage over the next guy, the next girl. You're in this world for an incredibly short period of time. That's what I've learned. Um, it's like it's not even a pinprick on a rhinoceros's ass. Your lifespan on the world—it's that short. Don't waste it. Wait to die. Find that thing you're good at. Find what your passion is. Don't go and do a job or do something you hate or do not enjoy for the money. That's miserable. That's not success. Wherever you reach in that, in, in that ladder, that's not success. Success is finding the things that you're passionate about, enjoying what you do. Those are the things that are going to make you exceptional. The, the last thing I, I really want to uh, leave you with is money. Is, is, that, is that what we all think success is? Do we all think money is, about, is success? Is that what we all want to do? Leave university, get a great job, make lots of money? You're all bloody quiet, aren't you? <laughs> um, money. Is it about money? Did I start work just to make money? Yes, I did. I didn't, we were poor, we had nothing. Absolutely, a single parent family in a council flat. So the thing that drove me, I needed money, I needed to be success, success gave me money. And then one day I woke up and realised I had more bloody money than I needed. And I was still very young. So what was I going to do? Stay in bed? No. Do I need more money? No. Do I need success? Yes. I need the challenge. I'm doing something that I'm passionate about. I want to get out of bed. So the money becomes a byproduct. It's a scorecard. It was mentioned earlier. It's a scorecard. All it is, at the end of the year, you fill in this thing called a tax return. Well, some people do. Um, <laughs> I won't mention them. But you fill in this thing called a tax return, and it shows how good you are, how successful you've been in making money. That's it. It's a, it's a scorecard. That's not the reason you will get out of bed. So find that passion. Find the thing that makes you jump out of bed in the morning and you can't wait to go and do it and enjoy your lives. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's lovely to be here, but it's pretty difficult to follow two of the country's most successful entrepreneurs and one of the country's leading uh, politicians. But, but let me try. Um, I was asked to think about the things, the ingredients that have led me down the path that I can work down, which is with about four different careers. And without wishing to sound at all um, odd about it, I mean, the first thing that I benefited from was a degree from this place. And you should all recognize how valuable it is that you go up here with a degree from Oxford. Cambridge is probably nearly as good. Um, <laughs> But in the days where I went out to seek a job, which is in stark contrast, I suspect, to what you're about to face, um, it was very easy because there were jobs and there weren't enough of us coming out of Oxford Cambridge to take them. 
to get one. So that I wrote to three city solicitors firms asking for uh, studentship articles of the same form. Got interviews from all three. Uh, the interview that I um, first took was conducted in the corridor at the back of the law court because the two partners had a law case going on at the time. So I was escorted down to the law court. So I was interviewed on a bench in the back of the court. The only question I remember being asked was, do you play golf? <laughs> and my stock answer historically had been, I'm not only one. But some instinct told me that that was perhaps the wrong answer. So I'd simply said no. And it turned out I was talking to two fanatical golf players. Um, so you know, that's an example of just a little bit of luck and a little bit of judgment. Uh, and I got the job. Um, over the years, I spent 17 years in a partnership in the city as a lawyer. <coughs> I was then asked to go uh, to run the corporate finance department in the Merchant Bank. And I did that. It was a difficult decision. Um, being a partner in a law firm was a very stable and secure role. And going into investment banking was seen as being you know, somewhat risky. Um, but I was fortunate, my firm said that I could have a two year re entry ticket. And so I had no risk at all. And took the view that if I didn't try something different, I never would. So I went off to try investment banking. And that worked out reasonably well. Uh, I then tried to retire uh, at the age of 55 and then found that I was the chairman of uh, a newspaper group, uh, which was fascinating and fun, um, and of a very big conglomerate, uh, which was much more challenging. Um, I finished those two roles and was then approached to become chairman of one of our clearing banks, uh, Lloyds. Now, I thought at this point in time that I was going to take life easier and retire and spend more time with my family and so on. And uh, a great friend of mine said, look, Victor, you're not being asked to do this job. It's your obligation. Those were the days when banks were seen rather differently from the way they seemed before. It's your obligation. If you're asked to do it, you must do it. So I went off and became um, the chairman of the bank for five years. Now, I'm corporate now, unlike these characters, and, and what did I find on the way through? I mean, certainly a lot of luck, certainly a lot of being in the right place at the right time, and you cannot legislate for it. I mean, there is an element of that, and you, you, you've just got to accept it. And I accept that I've been incredibly lucky uh, in the way, um, the, the, in the career that I've had. Um, just one or two indicators as to what is important when you go in to run uh, a business. The first thing is that you, you set a strategy and you set a plan and then you execute it. You can't do it on your own. So you need to have people around you who have common cause with you, who see the business the way you do, who get an excitement from the plan, from the journey that you're looking at. Um, Peter talked about friends. <coughs> I'm talking about something slightly different, which is having around you people who are both congenial and collegiate, but also who share uh, your vision for the business. Uh, but the friends bit is certainly important. Um, you don't need to make enemies. You don't need to clamber up uh, greasy poles and push other people down them, or climb trees and push people off them. Uh, there, there are lots of ways in which you can pick and select people who you want to work with and do that in a personable way and have people around you who you want to work with and who you enjoy working with. There are a number of stakeholders in any business. Um, the people around you, the people employed in the business are one of the stakeholders. The other for most businesses are the customers, the people who give those businesses their profits, their earnings. And you need to be market focused. You need in any business you go into to recognize what it is that makes that business successful. So you need to see what makes somebody walk in the door of one of the shops or decide to go to one bank rather than another. And you need to give people a feeling that they are welcome and valued as customers. And that's part, I think, of being people centric, whether it's the people around you or the customers in the business. 
Um, reputation and integrity, Peter talked about. <coughs> I couldn't agree more. If you want to be successful in business, you need a reputation for integrity and honesty. Um, you need to make that reputation, you need to husband it, and you only need one slip to lose it. So you can build it for a lifetime, you can lose it with one slip. So take care and don't. And the last thing I'd perhaps say before finishing is that if you're successful in business, you've got to be thankful for that success, whether it's been luck, judgment, hard work, whatever. And you therefore have to recognise an obligation to give back to society something that you've learned in your business life. So if you've got business acumen like these characters have, then put it back into a charity, into some philanthropy, into some social, to some social purpose. Michael Howard talked movingly about Hell, is it uh, Helen Helen House. Helen House. Um, and, and that's important and that's something whenever you get an opportunity you should do. Recognise the value of what you've been given through success in your job. And make sure you give back to the society that's benefited you as you go along the way.
or any other kind of business, you better pay attention to these things, because there's somebody with a traffic warden mentality going to come and check on you. And if you're not adhering to this, you're going to be in trouble one way or another. So the over-interference of the government, the many unnecessary, over-bureaucratic, silly regulations that come out are, um, are just not helpful to business at all. And if you link that with some of the tax directives in some countries, you know, if you're in California now, you're potentially going to pay 75% of your income in tax. Well, nobody's going to be in California starting a business, creating jobs, because it's not reasonable to take 75% of what someone earns and take it as a tax. And then if they die, there's an inheritance tax. And it's just ridiculous. People don't then work for it, as the French will find who are trying to have a tax rate on a certain band of, of, of 75%. People will be less motivated, less stimulated. And this kind of government interference, whether it's regulatory, bureaucratic, or overtaxation, all has a dampening effect on the economy and puts people off and people think, seek other places to go and um, practice their skills and, uh, and be successful in business and create jobs. So the answer to your question, from my point of view, is yeah, it, 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 is, it is a hindrance. But it also it, it disempowers people. You've got too much regulation. Um, now, some of you will have heard about the report of the Army Standard Charter um, which gives some horrific examples of what happened in a hospital where, and this is grossly overstated, I would say, there is too much regulation, too much and too much box ticking, and not enough actual caring uh, for patients. Um, I remember some years ago when I was the chairman of the newspaper group that the editor of the newspaper sent a student into a hospital to work just to see what was going on. And it doesn't matter what hospital it was, but the student came out and he discovered a room in the basement of this hospital where soiled linen from the hospital was blood and all sorts of horrible things on the floor. And in the same room, food was coming in on pallets in the opposite direction. So this was a big sort of tabloid story. The editor of the newspaper rang the hospital and spoke to the chief executive and said, and told the story that there was this room where dirty linen was coming going out and food was coming in and the same And the guy said, well, it's not my responsibility. We've outsourced food and we've outsourced our laundry. So it's not my responsibility. And the trouble with you know, outsourcing with regulation is that it takes away the ability of good people to take responsibility and do their job and do their job properly. I think, I think that's right. I think what happens is everybody becomes more concerned about avoiding accountability. And certainly, if you want to be in business, and I think that's what we're talking about tonight, and you want to be successful, you have to have accountability. <coughs> Everybody in your business has to be accountable, whether it's for their budget, whether it's for their customer service, whether it's for financial control, maintenance, product development, doesn't matter what it is, you have to have accountability. Everybody has to know what the rules are very clearly. They are accountable for this, and they've got to take that very, very seriously. So what happens with all this regulatory stuff, as we've been saying, is people try to avoid accountability, and that's a very unhealthy situation, a very bad thing. It's actually having the adverse effect to what the legislators were, were, were hoping for and anticipating. Hang on a minute. It's all the government's fault. Is there too much regulation? Yes, I agree. Does too much of it come from Brussels? Yes, I agree. Does it get in the way of business? Yes, I agree. But let's not pretend that we would like to live in a world where there was no regulation. Some regulation is necessary. It is sometimes necessary for government to intervene. Present government is just in the process of introducing new regulations to govern the operation of the banks. Does anybody believe that the banks should be left without any regulations? Of course not. So the difficulty is, and it is difficult, the difficulty 
is striking the right balance. You have to get the balance right. I mean, I agree with the other members of the panel that it's not right at the moment. I agree that there is too much regulation at the moment, uh, and I agree that too much of it comes from Brussels. But let's not pretend that we can sweep away all regulation and allow business to exist in a world untrammeled by any government intervention. But didn't the last government do exactly that to regulate everything, which led to disasters? I think no one is saying that, that needs to happen. What we're saying is common sense needs to prevail. As long as it's accepted that you can't sweep away all the conditions, and there is a place for sensible regulation, there is a place for striking the right balance between government intervention and allowing free enterprise to do the job that it needs to do, which is to create jobs, create wealth, and make our society prosperous. But Michael, what, what do you think, apart from regulatory things, when you look at taxation, which is just another government legislation, what is the threshold of tax which allows government to function and is reasonable on society, but still allows uh, for people to be motivated, to invest, to make money, to work hard? I mean, do you think, for example, in this country, we have it about right, or do you think it's too high or too low? You know, what would you think? I th I think I think it's too high, except for the fact that the government needs the money. Um, but, you know, the government needs the money. It needs the money to provide all the services that we benefit from, schools, roads, hospitals, the armed forces, the police. Government needs money. And as a result of the fact, you know, the previous government borrowed far too much money, the government, present government is also having to try and reduce our deficit and our debt. So I would like to see taxation in our country lower than it is today. But I accept that in the current economic circumstances, that is not possible. But don't you think, if we're honest, that's sort of hiding slightly behind an umbrella in the sense that um, it's a bit like a business that says, gee, we're not making any profits uh, this year. Uh, we better put all the charges up and charge the customers more. Yeah, let's take a hotel. Gosh, we're not making any money in our hotel. Let's just increase the room rate and the food charges and the drinks. I'll make you more money, will it? Uh, no. Will make more money? Well, it would, but the, the issue is you'd have no customers. There we right. go. So, no, I think I think I think <laughs> so the issue is we'd have no customers, right? So what we have to do is... Put the is up again. Let's get rid of the customers. Exactly. So the issue is, therefore, we have to look at the hotel and say, wait a minute, we don't need one waitress for every 12 customers. One girl can hustle hard, run around, she can do 18 customers. We only need one gardener, he can mow the grass a bit quicker, and blah, blah, blah. Let's look at our costs, let's cut our costs, let's get efficient, let's get rational, let's get disciplined, let's get motivated, give everybody an incentive to move quicker, be more productive, work harder. I think the problem isn't, I agree the government needs more money, but the answer by government is a wrong answer. Don't take it from the people who generate the money. We are the customer, aren't we? We are the customer, and we're not willing to pay anymore because we're not getting good value. What we want is the government to look at its house, get it in order, get efficient, stop being wasteful, reduce the number of people it employs, send them out into the private sector, stimulate the private sector to create more jobs to absorb them, and get the cost down, and tax will come down. But, but that sounds that sounds like David Cameron's election speech, <laughs> except he didn't know how to do it, because we all voted, and thought, it's a perfect, exactly what you could one just completely ready to speak. But he is doing it. But let's get some, let's get some reality in this discussion. Let's get some facts. It's easy to spout the kind of nonsense he's just there. Oh, whatever you do, do not, whatever you do, create anything in your life that's called nonsense. Yes, but the, the fact is that what, um, I quite agree that the government should be cutting down the waste. I quite agree that the government should be reducing the headcount of public servants. I quite agree that the government should be reducing the welfare bill. I quite agree that the government should be encouraging the private sector. And there has been, in the last two years, 
a very significant reduction in the public sector, there has been a very significant diminution in the number of public sector jobs. And the reason why unemployment is not rising is because there has been an increase of jobs in the private sector to make up the gulf. So what indeed David Cameron said should happen at the last election is indeed happening. That's exactly what we've seen in the last two years. Now, of course, it's not enough. There's always room for more. And the government is going to do more. It is doing more. But I entirely agree that that should be done. The point is, it is being done. And you but should recognise that when you talk about these subjects. No, but Michael, Michael, let's be realistic about this. Firstly, the government is not ruthless. The government is political and the government tempers every decision with votes, politics, compromise, and everything else. If this was a business, and you told Theo and I to go into it, we would take a red pen and we would slash 10 times more than the government is doing. Ruthlessly, take the pain, one big hit, get it over with, don't do it piecemeal, a bit here, a bit there, a bit there. As I said, oh, but we wouldn't be worried about being re-elected, would we? No, of course not. Which would be so, just as well. So, what, 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 you know, as I said to you this evening, I'm driving up the M5, the traffic's piling up, why on earth is the government spending all this money all over the country removing the iron barriers that have done their job for 50 years with concrete barriers costing hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds that are absolutely not essential because some, I'm sorry to say, academic theorist somewhere has proved that a concrete barrier is slightly more effective than an iron rail barrier. The, the problem is government doesn't have the courage of its convictions. I don't think either of us doubt the intentions of government. When Mr. Cameron and others got elected, I think they subscribed to what people like us say. Unfortunately, once in office, they find the civil servants run them more than they probably run the civil servants, and the civil servants resist change, the civil servants like it all the way it is, and therefore, to some degree, the leaders of different departments are slightly hamstrung and can't do what they want, and therefore, half of what they'd like to do doesn't get done, and therefore but we have But do you think that's a of interest? Because if you, on one hand you need to be re-elected, and on the other hand you have a job to do that might be unpopular, it's a difficult, difficult balance. So is there anything that the government wouldn't say yes to to get re-elected re that would, should be a no in favour of the benefit of the country? Isn't it, isn't it absolutely wonderful to yeah. talk about these things with such certainty and such conviction and the lack, okay. the lack of any conceivable self-doubt when you have no experience whatsoever? <laughs> <laughs> Why would I want to spend my life producing well, nothing other than air? I, I, I,
I changed the whole basis of criminal justice in this country. And the officials in the Home Office were appalled. They wanted to carry on doing things in exactly the way they'd been doing them for years before. And there were occasions when people from the press would phone up the Home Office and say, what's the policy on this? And they'd get the answer, well, Home Office policy is A, B, and C, but the Home Secretary thinks it ought to be X, Y, and Z. But that situation didn't last for long, because I made it clear that I wanted to do things my way, and I did things my way. So, quite contrary to what the learned gentleman on my right said, quite contrary, quite, quite, quite contrary to the opinions they've expressed with such certainty and such conviction, I can assure them that if the Minister knows what he wants to do and is determined to do it, he will get his way. He will not be... Is that the rule of exception? He will not be subordinated to the civil servants. And I think that is, I won't say it's the universal rule in the present government, because you will always find exceptions. But I think that is what most ministers in the present government are doing. It's in particular what Michael Gove is doing at the Department of Education. Ian Douglas Smith is doing, and he's uh, curbing the welfare bill, and it is in general what this government is doing. There's always more to be done, there's always the opportunity to make more savings, and I think the government will make a determined attempt to look at them. But my we ought to try to base our discussion of these matters on facts and not facts. Ah, but Michael, surely you'll agree that though the diagnosis by government business situation in the country is right, the medicine is too weak, too little, too late, over too long a period of time, and it's like an antibiotics. If they're not intense and taken strongly and consistently, consistently, they don't work. And that's the problem. The problem is that it's not enough to cure the problem, because the issue isn't really totally about unemployment. You know, we should say that we're quite lucky compared to some countries, well over 90% of people in this country have a job. Instead of everybody talking about how many are employed, we are very lucky that well over 90% have a job. We all wish it was more than 90 odd percent, but it's still over 90%. So it isn't just the issue of jobs, it's the issue of sustaining those jobs, improving the quality of jobs, having jobs where people can earn more money and have a better standard of life, and that needs investment. And you won't get investment unless business has confidence that the government's got a real grip on the situation and is giving a strong enough dose of medicine, which I think we're suspicious of, aren't we? Yeah, listen, at the end of the day, when you think about the things that were said at the last election, we all knew that whoever was going to take control of this country was inherited a poison chalice. The economy was absolutely, if not use too fine a word, but we squandered all the great times we had. In fact, it, the strange thing about quite a few people I work with, my colleagues, is they've not lived through a recession. They've only lived through this great, fantastic entitlement years we've had for such a long time. And it's really the hardest thing I've had to do was try and keep them tempered down and sensible and keep the feet on the ground. Because salaries always went up, we always made more money, the consumers spent more money, government spent a lot of wasted money everywhere. It was, we never saved anything. We never put anything away. And the interesting thing, when I went around the city on a project once, and was very proud of my achievements in my business, and I sat in front of a fund manager, he was a bit spotty, so I'm not going to let you guess his age. But I sat in front of him and I regaled my um, uh, achievements and my businesses and my balance sheets and how we had cash on the balance sheets and the debt, how we were profitable, profits have gone up every year. And he looked at me and he said, you know what, you're exactly the type of person I would invest in. So you can imagine, I took that really well. <laughs> Um, so before um, asking him if he had any pubic hairs, um, I went on to ask him why. And he said, because you don't make your assets 
sweat. You're not going to blame that on the cup. I'm not, no, no, no. <laughs> but my point I'm getting to is, he point was everything needs to be leveraged, you know, you need to expose yourself. And one of the things I've always said, I, you know, I take risks every, every single day, but I take calculated risks. I've never in my whole life bet the farm, ever. And I have no intention, you must never, take calculated risks, assess the situation. And I think that's something that we need to do more of. I'm not suggesting for one minute we bet the farm, but I do feel we did bet the farm. We bet the farm in too many places that we never recognised we were betting the farm. And we allowed it to happen, and we never put any of that away. And now, of course, there's another generation who's going to have to pay the price. And it's difficult to explain to someone who's 20-something, who's lived through a wonderful period of the economy, where everything's been brilliant, and it's always been about bigger house, house prices going up, that all of a sudden, things are going to be tough for the next 10, 15 years. And that's something we're all, we're all going to take on board. The difficult thing for government, Michael, is they do need to get reelected, so maybe they can't give that medicine that we all wish that would happen. But the important thing for me is that the acknowledgement that what needs to happen has to be also matched <laughs> with the action that what needs to happen. And sometimes that, as a business, can be very frustrating. Just before we get up to the floor, uh, let's get one more question. Well, we're not going to let them talk as well, are we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just kind of as a last question to ask, how much difference do you find giving them to this project has made in your experience in your industries? If you talk about people you know, um, don't think that's a bypass for normal business channels. I mean, it's just it's helpful if you have a relationship with somebody who knows of your honesty, integrity, your character, your skills, and so on. <coughs> One of the things I would say is that we're all too tempted uh, to communicate electronically as a substitute personal contact. And <coughs> we are perhaps all from a different generation. But we recognise, I recognise that you all communicate much more than now with your iPads or your handle or your iPhone or whatever. But it's not a substitute for interpersonal skills, it's a supplement, not a substitute. And don't think you can build the same relationship 
down the line, interpersonally, as you can face to face and through proper relationships. Can I ask a question? You were in the city for still a long time. I mean, how much of your time, your working time, is spent networking and actually putting the hours in and meeting people? And how much was actually doing the day job? Well, Theo, in my case, I don't think I've had the field of network in the sense of your requirement. I've met a lot of people through my job. I've met a lot of people who I hope have regards to my professional skills. <coughs> and I've met a lot of people who became friends. But I never spent my time in cocktail parties and lounges just trying to I'm talk to people as a, as a network. That, that, again, that's again, again, again. I, I'm, I'm not actually <coughs> taking it to that level. One of the things that, you know, we we're, were talking earlier, uh, and it's going to be important for you, is, and I'm about who you know, is putting the hours to be social, making friends, and networking. That those are key parts of your future in business. Uh, because we talked about earlier about making your own luck. Well, you have to be there to be lucky. <laughs> if you're not there, you won't do it. And I remember one of the pieces of advice I got very uh, on in my career was, you know, your stock is the people you know, the people that you can reach out to, the people that can vouch for you when you want to do something and you're in competition, the people who've had experience of you, who know you. And that's an important aspect of business going forward. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, in my case, I would say I spend one third of my time, of my working time, typically I work 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week. Uh, and I would say I spend one third of my time just spent on talking to people, meeting people, not on the cocktail circuit at all, but just meeting people professionally in business, uh, talking to them, trying to see what they're doing, learning from them, developing a relationship, chatting to them about what I'm doing. And, and the best example I can give you is, for example, if you are engaged in business with a government in a foreign country, and dealing with that government is important to your business because you're hoping to get a contract with that government to supply them with services or goods, then when you go to that country, you <coughs> naturally gravitate to meeting the Prime Minister, the Minister, the Assistant Minister, the Manager of whatever department is you're dealing with. But always be mindful, the governments come and go. People change in corporations. Today the board is this, tomorrow the board is that. You must always identify who could replace those people that are today important for your business. So if you look at the political level, yeah, I wouldn't dream of going to a country doing business with or paying my respects to a Prime Minister or a Minister of Finance or a Minister of Industry without, during that visit, going and paying my respects to the Leader of the Opposition, the Shadow Minister, whatever it is, the Shadow Secretary, whatever it is, because I don't know in four or five years' time that it's not all going to be changed and the people who are perhaps nobody's today for my business will be the somebody's of tomorrow. And if you don't take care to nurture, build those relationships, whether it's government levels, corporate levels, the media, whatever it is, you don't know who's going to be a senior person tomorrow, who's going to be a junior person today. So you have to invest, I believe in business, a substantial amount of your time. In my case, I would estimate it's about 30%. Because doing business at the end of the day isn't just about your product and your goods. It's not just about the service, it's not just about putting on the show, it's about relationships. And if you don't have relationships, you won't do business. And you have to have relationships. Not so much for when it's all going well, but when it's going bad. When the economy retracts and the buyers have to cut back on suppliers and they've got 10 suppliers at these tables, and they only need three, you want to be sure you're one of the three and you're not one of the seven that got cut. And a lot of that is obviously your product, obviously your price, but it's also relationship. And I think the point that Victor made is absolutely vital. 
you anything, too much is on text and email and this and that, the other is electronic, and it's fantastic communication, but it isn't relationship. There is no substitute for looking at someone in the eye, fair square, and having some interaction face to face with somebody else and building it. And then when you talk to them on the phone, then when you send them an email or a text or whatever it is, there's a relationship that's been established. And I really believe in business, a significant amount of your time has to be spent in that interpersonal uh, uh, type thing. We are now opening up questions um, to the floor.